So we're doing our possibly last lecture about margin and markup and pricing. It's two different sections that flow together and we'll probably just make one long video about this. The only complication is that the world of retail is divided up into two different business models. So we're going to be confused, not because math is hard, but because the words are too similar to each other. Because of that, I am going to be artificially careful. So the word price can be ambiguous. Are we talking about what the business pays to its supplier? That's one price. Or are we talking about what the customer pays to the business? That's another price. So to be very clear, this lecture is always going to use wholesale cost for what the business pays to the supplier and selling price to what the customer pays to the business. And real life is not so polite. So just be heads up that I'm using these phrases to be as careful as I can, but other things are. So the difference between these, how much more the selling price is than the wholesale cost so the business can make a profit and stay in business is called the margin amount. You can think about the margin at the edge of a page, how much more the physical page goes to its extreme physical boundary compared to the text inside it. It's like the padding around the wholesale cost. So if we want to write formulas, because we're a math class, we like formulas, then we're just saying, remember, we're subtracting. The margin amount is how much the customer pays minus what the business paid to the supplier. If we wanted to rearrange it, what the business paid to the supplier plus this extra margin amount, that's what the customer has to pay. So just to do one in our head, Dora's dress shop can get an item for $60 wholesale cost, and we'll sell it for an $80 selling price. What's the margin amount for that item? And are you going to chime in, Alex, or should I answer my own questions? I wasn't able to hear what the question was. OK, number one here on the screen. Dora's Dress Shop can get an item for $60 wholesale cost, sell it for an $80 selling price. So what's the margin amount for that item? Margin amount. Here. When the margin amount be 20? Yep. All we do is subtract 80 minus 60 is 20. Again, the math is easy. It's just the words are going to get a little hard. Some people like to write this as a rate, a percentage. So we use the formula for percent change, change divided by original. And the original for margin is the selling price. We're sort of starting at what the customer is paying, the bigger number, and looking down to the smaller number, the wholesale cost, what the business paid to the supplier. So that's what we call the original. So the selling price is going to be the original. The margin amount is the change. So in this case, if I peak, that $20, if I divide it by the $80 selling price, it's a 25% margin rate. Right? 20 is a quarter of 80, 25%. Number two, OK? Can I move on? Yes. Number three, another business has a 40% margin rate. They sell something for $300. So what's the wholesale cost of that item? What will they pay for that to the supplier? So I would take 40% and write it as 0.4, multiply it by 300. And that would be 120. So that the margin amount is 120. Then I have to subtract. So I take the 300, take away the 120, and I get 180 is what they would pay as the wholesale cost. So 120 was the margin amount, 180 would be the wholesale cost. So all of that hopefully makes sense. Yes. Now we're going to confuse you. 
Other businesses say the difference between the selling price and the wholesale cost should instead be called the markup amount instead of the margin amount. It's the same thing. We're subtracting the two numbers. So problem four, where that dress shop has a $60 wholesale cost and an $80 selling price, if we ask what's the markup amount, it is still 20. We're not changing anything but how we're naming the answer. What will change is the rate. Remember the rate was changed divided by original. So people with the markup mindset say that the original is not the selling price, but instead the wholesale cost. So their change divided by original will be the markup amount, which is also the margin amount, divided by this time the wholesale cost. So before, we were saying 20 divided by 80, but now we're going to do 20 divided by 60 because the smaller amount is what these people consider the original cost. So that same $20 now is called the 33% markup rate, even though it was a 25% margin rate because we're dividing by different numbers. So at this point, you're probably slightly confused and you just have to trust it, that it's like riding a bicycle and you do some homework and you get used to the funky vocabulary. But mark up looks up, the original is the smaller number and you look up from there. Margin looks down, you start with the higher number, the selling price and look down from there. Selling price is original. So we have four terms, margin amount and markup amount, and those are the same, and margin rate and markup rate, and those are different because we're dividing the first thing by a different amount. And I talk about that here, but I'm not going to read that out loud. That would just confuse you more. Some other people say, why don't we just call it profit instead of markup or margin? And that's because businesses have expenses other than their wholesale cost. Just because the dress shop earned $20 when they sold that dress, then that's not all profit. They have to pay payroll and insurance and rent and utilities and advertising and taxes and et cetera. So if you're very old, then you got to learn about this by playing lemonade stand on an old computer. Um, but anyway, so we don't use the word profit in these problems because we don't know what all these other types of expenses are. We can't actually find out if this dress shop is making any profit just because they earned $20 on that dress. There's no homework for this topic. You get your free check mark there. And if you want random exercises with answers, there they are. Okay, so far so good. Yes, I see in chat. Okay, so now we actually start doing a little more math. We're going to talk about pricing. So pricing is, as we're doing it here, not terribly exciting. We're talking about pricing methods. If you want good books, there's a fun book in the classroom library about the tactics that people use when retail pricing. When do prices end in 99 cents? And when do you put this on sale or that on sale? And all of these small decisions that will get changed to make your product stand out either in the store or when compared to the competition. So if you're going into a small, run a small business, then you certainly want to learn more about pricing. This is not a lecture for that. This is just what methods are there out there. The first one we'll call markup pricing. And this one is the one that for most people seems to make the most sense because people tend to do a lot more shopping than running a store. So many businesses will base their decisions on the wholesale suppliers and their primary concern is to build relationships with these suppliers and build brand loyalties and acquire goods inexpensively. And although these other businesses are aware of the competition they have for selling things, then that's not their main focus. They focus on the wholesale side. So for these businesses, what makes sense to them is to set prices with a markup rate. So they'll say, I know the wholesale cost, my supplier can get me this thing. 
And then I'm going to multiply it using that one plus trick, just like we did for compound interest. And then we'll get the selling price. So problem seven, Granny's Gardening Supplies uses a 40% markup rate. So that we're just going to plug in here and make a 1.4 out of this whole thing. If the wholesale cost is 50 bucks, then what's the selling price the store should use? So they start with what they pay their supplier, the 50, multiply it by 1.4, 40% more than 100%, and they get 70 bucks. So there we go. Markup pricing has a few issues. Not all goods should be given the same percentage increase. Goods that have a higher volume of sales can be have assigned a lower percent increase to attract customers, but still be profitable. If something is trendy, you can charge more for it temporarily. So problem eight gets a little more complicated. Instead of just saying we start with 50 and go up 40%, then we're going to say that the best selling tools, they use a 50% markup rate and then add $5. And they can get away with that because that's their hot items. So if a rake is $8, what would they do? So we'll do this. First, we'll multiply it by 1.5. What is eight and half of eight? That would be eight and four is 12. And then we add $5 and we get 17 as our final answer. So you can be trickier than just percent increase. Here's a colorful chart. Newly invented goods are usually expensive when they're first made. And then as the technology matures, their wholesale cost decreases. And the history of a good can also refl reflect what's called its penetration into society. So this chart, uh, this graph says, look, telephones started out with almost no one having them and they grew pretty slowly. And then right after 1930, fewer people had phones in their homes. And then it went up again at a, roughly the same rate as before. And then it petered off. Compare that to refrigerators, where when they were introduced, the percentage of households that had one shot up pretty quickly to 100% and then it has stayed there. Other things that were slow were a stove, those were, I'm guessing they mean electric stoves. Those were pretty slow. Other things that were fast were things like air conditioning or a color TV. Actually, air conditioning was slow in the beginning, wasn't it? Anyway, there's microwaves. My family was one of the last holdouts that didn't have a microwave and so on. So you can adjust how pricing actually happens, but the gist of it is that for markup pricing, you start with the wholesale cost and then you multiply it with the one plus trick by whatever percentage markup rate your business uses. Some businesses bundle items together to smooth out the effect of wholesale costs. So considering a, consider a store that sells vegetables, conventional lettuce and carrots, those are sold at high volume. People buy lots of lettuce and carrots. And so there's not much margin to them. No one would buy carrots and lettuce from this grocery store if they could drive a little farther and get them cheaper at a different store. Organic spinach and kale are sold at a much lower volume, but they have a greater margin. So you can make mixed greens in your store and you'll see supermarkets do this. They have a little um, kind of buffet table often where here's our own mixed greens we've made fresh in the store for you. And then they can have a specific balance they want of the volume sold and the margin per item. You can try an effect with that, a problem with that effect if you want. Its answer is there. Okay, so that's markup pricing. And that makes sense to most people because we're mostly shoppers. So we start with what the wholesale cost that the store paid to the supplier is, and then we go up and that's sort of the penalty we pay as a customer that things have to be more expensive because the store needs to make money. Other businesses use margin pricing. They base their decisions primarily on the competition. Their primary concern is monitoring how their prices compare to the selling prices of similar goods at other stores. 
they know that their inventory has weak brand loyalty and customers will shop elsewhere if they see a better deal. So they keep their selling prices as high as a tough market allows. And although these businesses are certainly aware that they need good relationships with their wholesale suppliers, they just can't afford to think about that as their primary thing to think about. So they set their prices with a margin rate. And it's the same as before, except we're looking down from the selling price to the customer. So we start with the selling price, and instead of a plus, we have a minus here. So now we have a different gardening supply store. They have a 40% margin rate. If the selling price of an item is $50, then what's the most they can pay to be able to afford to have this in their store? So this is starting to get slightly tricky. Let's actually go to the Jamboard. Just because subtracting in our head can be a little harder than adding. So I'm going to take that selling price, the $50, and I'm multiplying it by one minus the 40%. So one minus 0.4 is 0.6. What this is saying is that of the $50 that we put the price tag on that the customer sees, we can pay our wholesale supplier 60% of that. The other 40% is our margin, so we can make some profit. So what is 50 times 0.6? That's going to be 30. So if this store can find some wholesale supplier that can get them this item for 30 bucks or less, then they can sell this item. If they can't, if the cheapest that any wholesale supplier would be able to provide this is 40 bucks, then they just have to not sell this because they won't be able to make enough. So in other words, they can only stock goods for which they found a supplier that can provide the items for 60% or less of that selling price. Again, no store will use this formula completely consistently. They don't need to price all goods equally to undercut the competition. Businesses that use margin pricing frequently use loss leaders to attract customers. They have great deals on a few items and either put signs in their windows of their grocery store or send out a mailer like Costco. So a famous example is either the milk grocery stores, often milk is sold for either no margin or even a loss, because once people walk all the way to the back of your grocery store to get milk, they'll buy other things also. Or Costco's chickens. Costco sells about 60 million chickens a year, and each chicken costs Costco about 57 cents. So if we take 60 million, 60 with six zeros after it, and multiply it by 0.57, then 57 cents each as a loss. So it's costing Costco about 34 million to provide chickens for less than it costs them. But there were, um, they think it's worth it. It gets people in their store and people will buy more than 57 cents of stuff when they walk to the back of the store to get their pre-cooked chicken. So businesses with margin pricing, they have to balance what's called skim pricing and penetration pricing. Remember penetration pricing was that other chart where almost everyone owns one of these things by now. It's not a hot new item anymore. So here's a little graph. When something is new and hot, we can sell it for more. That's called the skim price. And as time goes on, more and more people have it. And eventually it sort of settles at its long-term price. That's what we call the penetration price. So many customers are happy, even excited to pay more for new and innovative products. There's nothing immoral about skim pricing, but if you're 
a business that has excessive or inappropriate skim pricing, then that will make a public relations backlash. And we've seen that with Apple's stuff a couple of times. A large business fighting for market share can also do less skim pricing than their competitors, attempting to undercut their competition more. They will lose short-term profit, but sometimes that's a good long-term strategy. So there's a problem here where you can compare for Stony PlayStation 3s, what the 2006 price is and the 2009 price is and find some differences. And just like the markup pricing has bundling, the margin pricing can bundle things also. And you'll see this often with phones that you can buy the same cell phone from lots of different stores. So most cell phone stores will bundle things and say, we have a phone and a data plan and here's some cables and here's some free warranty and things like that because the phones themselves are nothing special. As another colorful picture, the modern world is so full of data that businesses can now immediately measure how demand changes for goods and services and automatically adjust pricing to match that demand. This is called adaptive pricing. This is why when you are trying to buy a plane trip online, if you use the same computer and the same browser to shop, then your prices will change because the website airlines will say, oh, she's really looking for a flight to San Diego. We should start increasing the price we are charging her for that. If you used private browsing mode, then you might see the price change because they don't know it's you. Again. So here's a fun thing that somebody made, uh, a picture that shows for this microwave oven at some point, I don't remember which year this is, then Sears always had it cost the same amount. It was always 900. They had a very boring website. Best Buy would normally have it cost a little more than 800 except between the hours of about 5.30 and 7.30 at night when it would shoot up to match the Sears price. So apparently they thought people were getting home doing some shopping before or after dinner on the computer and they didn't want to miss out on the comparative price compared to Sears during that time. Amazon's price went up and down all over. They had some complicated thing that their computer was doing. And during that dinner time, then they made it cheaper. They wanted people to shop at Amazon during dinner time. Our classroom library has a book with more about this if you're interested in adaptive pricing. Okay. Something I'm not going to talk about because no one this term in Math 25 cares about culinary uh, often we have culinary program students, is that if you are in the culinary program, there's two things they want you to learn. The desired profit method is where you add up the food and the labor and other costs, and then you multiply that by one plus a markup rate. And then when you're done, because no one buys the entire vat of soup at the restaurant, you have to divide by how many servings there are. So this is exactly what we saw as the markup pricing formula. You take all of your wholesale costs, multiply them by one plus the wholesale uh, markup rate, except that if you found out that your whole vat of soup cost $100 to make, but that was 20 servings, as a final step, you do 100 divided by 20 is a $5 bowl of soup. The food cost percentage method is a little different. So read about this if you're curious. It's basically saying that there are a lot of restaurants where this is too complicated. The labor and the other stuff just doesn't matter compared to how much the food cost is. And so they'll have a different one. Finally, there's discount. Discount gets a little complicated because of the math, finally. Everything else I mentioned is like riding a bike. We've used too many words because they've just been established in the retail industry. 
but the math we've done was all just subtracting or multiplying by one plus a number or one minus a number. Now discount actually gets a little complicated. Discount starts looking like the margin pricing. We're going down from a selling price, so we do one minus the discount rate. So let's do an example problem. So something is $80 originally. We're multiplying it by one minus 0.15, one minus 15%. So that's going to be 0.85, 85% is left. What is that? 80 times 0 0.85, $68. That one happy so far before we get complicated? It makes sense so far. Okay. So the annoying thing is this chain discount. So let's do number 19. It's not annoying or hard if you follow the rules, but there's this incredible temptation to cheat and it doesn't work. So let's talk about that. So we start with $100. And we're going on sale at 15% off. So that's going to be one minus 0.15 is 0.85 again. So at this point, it costs $85. As the next step, we start with that 85 and there's a store-wide seasonal sale. It's another 20% off. So we're going to have one minus 0 0.2 is 0.8. I suppose I should color code things huh? so that people who are watching this later will be happier. So we had 85% remaining from the first cut. And then we had 80% remaining from the second cut. So what's $85 times 0.868. And now we have another cut by 10%. So that means there's 0.9, 90% remains after the third cut. And we get $61.20. So all we did was use this formula three times, a blue time, a red time, and a green time. There's this great temptation to somehow combine the highlight numbers, and it doesn't work. So if you're interested, play around at home, see what happens if you smash them together and make 45% or so on, but it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is just like that Scrooge McDuck problem where his investment went up 4% and then down 4% and he wound up lower than he started because the second time it was 4% of a bigger number, which is a bigger 
decreased, just like 4% of Bill Gates' income is bigger than 4% of my income. So these percents aren't percents of the same number. This is 15% of 100. This is 20% of 85. This is 10% of 68. So you have to keep them separate because they are percents of different numbers. You can't smoosh them all together and percent, pretend that they are percents of 100 because only one of them is a percent of 100. So take your time, do the three steps. It's an easy formula. Don't try and cheat because it won't work. The hardest one, which I'm not going to make you do now, is the missing link. What if you had a chain discount, but we're not sure what one of the miss middle things is? If you've had some algebra before, this works pretty smoothly. If you haven't seen any algebra in your own math history, then this can just be frustrating. So if we want a second video, I will be happy to do some of these, but I don't want to add this confusing. Let's look at what the homework is. As before, when you're done, open up the new thing and do all the bubbles and get your code at the bottom. So we started out pretty simple, 40% margin rate. Margin, remember, we're going down from the selling price. So it has to give us the selling price. If this problem gave us the wholesale cost, we couldn't plug things in the formula. Grace works at a store that has a 40% markup rate. Now we're starting from the wholesale cost. So that's what this gave us. Again, a margin rate starts with a selling price. And again, a number four, a markup rate starts with a wholesale cost. So we're going back and forth to try and confuse you, but it's the same easy formula as we started with the first time. Then we do a compare and contrast. She wants to sell something for a high price. It cost her the lower price. How would we take that $40 profit and change it into both rates, the margin rate and the market rate? Remember which we 40 divided by something, but which we divide by is different. In one case, it's the 6250. In the other case, it's the 10250. Now we have problem six. They need a certain selling price to the customer and they have a wholesale cost. What's the markup rate? So they're trying to trick you here. Is the markup rate based on this or that and so on? Hopefully if you've done number five, it'll roll off pretty quickly. Then we have a comparison. A fancy new infant car seat has this skim price, but eventually it settles down to a lower price. If the wholesale cost is this, then first find the larger margin, subtract 220 minus 67, then find the smaller margin, the 150 minus 67, and divide one by the other. You'll find what percent of extra margin they got. It's gonna there's the restaurant meal using both methods for the culinary students. If you're not a culinary student, you can do this because it's not hard or you could skip it. A discount problem and a chain discount problem. As always, there's random problems at the end. Do as many of them as you need to practice. These are the ones that are on the test. And then negativity instinct talks about in factfulness lines often bend when they don't look like it. And this chart we saw earlier is a great example of things that looked like straight lines for a while, but actually weren't going to continue like straight lines forever. So that's the most important part of the business finance chapter. If we kept going, we could talk about charge options, layaway plans, installment plans, zero down plans, and credit cards. Those might be really helpful if you know anyone that's going to be doing some holiday shopping, Black Friday weekend, 
and is wondering about buying a big ticket thing, a TV or a couch or a dining room table or something. And there's problems there. You saw that was a really short thing. The fair spinner games, I have these plastic spinners in a box. And if we were sitting together in a room, I would give everyone a plastic spinner. You'd set it on top of these circles and we would try and make little games. And that's cool and fun, but I can't really do it on Zoom. So we'll start talking about probability and odds, if you want a video on that, here instead of at the fair spinner games. And so probability and odds, we're rolling dice. We're getting gumballs of different colors from a machine some basic probability. The important thing to learn about probability is that there's, again, real life different vocabulary called absolute change or relative change. In the same situation with valid math has very different answers based on if you're using absolute change type of change or relative change type of change. So if you're going into sociology or medicine or anything like that, then this helps you not be tricked when you're reading literature about different things. Is this really an, a noticeable change or not? And then weighted averages, also called expected values, is a cool thing to end up with, but it's a little complicated and it's just one problem. So if you don't want to do that later on, you can. Okay, so that's all of business decisions. We did margin and markup and pricing pretty quick today because I wasn't interrupted with questions. And then if you want, later this week, we can do charge options if that sounds practical and not wasting money when you're shopping. Or we'll do probability and odds since that's a good one for lots of people with what they encounter at the workplace. Any last minute questions before I stop the recording? Okay, so send me more um, questions. I didn't do very much on the Jamboard at all. So I'm happy to do a lot more and more videos once I know which problems you need feedback on.